Before we begin this podcast, please be advised that the following episode contains language that some listeners may find offensive and inappropriate. The opinions expressed by the host and guests are their own and do not reflect the views of the podcast producers. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to Voices of a Killer and to the harrowing tale of Chris Piercy and the tragic deaths of Tish Yarbrough Piercy and Landon Piercy. Last time, Chris was in the heat of the tragic moment where, in a drug-induced psychosis brought on by overuse of coracidin, he shot and killed his wife, Tish. Now we start back up with Chris still in his dining room and his retelling of the aftermath of what really happened on this episode of Voices of a Killer. You don't remember how it all went down when you killed her? It was a little while before I realized that she was dead. That came a little bit after after I ran to go get Landon. Okay. But I remember running in and grabbing him. And I remember taking off into the front room. And I remember falling. And that's part of the reason that I've always wondered if I didn't fall on him. Just because I remember tripping as I was trying to run into the front room from the dining room. Is he screaming? At the, is your son screaming while you're holding him? I never heard him scream. Okay. He, uh, I never heard him, you know, actually say him. Do you think maybe you shot him before you picked him up? No, he wasn't shot. Okay. Did you still, you were holding the gun while you were holding him though, running? I think I dropped it at that point, actually. Okay. So you fell and then what happened? So I, I fell and I hit the ground and I turned around and looked to see what I had tripped on and what I had tripped off was, was this. And so I jumped over her to, to grab her. And again, like I said, for some reason, I had this thought like we needed to get out and get to the river. And uh, I, I jumped over her and went to grab her. And that was when I, I put my hand right in the puddle of blood. And, and that was when I realized that she was shot. How'd that make you feel right there? I can't say. It was, I, it's surreal. It was one of those things. It, it's almost an overload to the point to where it just shuts something off in you. You literally went from making love to your wife to killing your whole family. Yeah. That's a pretty crazy story. And what, what to me felt like a matter of seconds. I remember I looked down and I saw her. That was when I first realized that she was dead. And like I said, I didn't actually know she was shot then. I knew she was dead. Chris's decision-making process was consumed by chaos and confusion. Under the influence of Coruscant, his ability to rationally think and act had been drastically impaired. His mind was caught in a surreal fog where reality blurred, leaving him unsure of his own actions and surroundings. His movements were fragmented, and as he stumbled, his perception of what was happening was warped beyond comprehension. The situation escalated as Chris grabbed his son, Landon, but in the confusion, he tripped only to find himself falling over Tish. It was in this moment, with his hand touching the pool of blood, that he was faced with the devastating reality. His wife had been shot. This realization was overwhelming, but in his altered state, the emotional weight of what had happened barely registered. And while Chris struggled to grasp what was real and what wasn't, the gunshots that had rung out would have surely been heard by the neighbors, signaling to the outside world that something terrible had taken place. What impact did those shots have, and how did the neighbors respond? Did y'all live in an area where people heard gunshots? We actually did. We had neighbors real close on one side and pretty close on the other side. But nobody ever called the cops, so I don't know if... What did you do after you saw what you did? Um, and I can't really explain this, but for some reason, I got it in my head that because of the whole enlightenment thing that, that we had gone through, me and my brother-in-law, that I could somehow basically bring her back from the dead. Like that it wasn't too late that I could just save her somehow. And how would you, how are you going to do that? Like I said, I know I'm crazy with sounds, but I was basically by killing myself. One of the one one of the articles says that you beat your son to death. How'd you do that? From falling on him? I like I said, I that's the only thing that I can think of 
is that I fell with him or dropped him or because I because I honestly I don't know. You don't think the hallucin you don't you don't think the hallucinations made him a threat to you? The thing is, is after okay, the other man while I was in the dining room, I don't remember ever swinging at anything. So you assessed all the damage that you did. Where were the bodies at? Were they both in the same area? Well, so so Tish was laying in the, the doorway between the front room and the, the dining room. And the first time I saw Landon, he was he was on the floor in the bedroom. Did you try to do anything with their deceased body? I yeah. I grabbed her and I pulled her into the bedroom and I I put Landon back in his bathroom. Uh, where? I, and, and back in his bathroom. Okay. You know, like the little bed. Yeah. He's and, only five months old, isn't he? Yeah. And like I said, I, for some reason, and it seems perfectly logical that, that if I basically, if I killed myself, that they would be able to come back and cut my wrist open. I took a bunch of pills. How come you didn't um, use actually, the gun? I actually did grab the gun, but it was empty. And I, I didn't realize that I, I'm pretty sure there were more bullets in the house, but it didn't register. It was just, it was empty. I put it in my mouth at one point, just, it was just empty. And, but. Uh, so did you, the point that you're putting your son in the bassinet and seeing that the damage that you, did you realize at that point that you had fucked up? Honestly, I didn't realize what had happened until about two days later when I was in Biggs, the mental hospital. How'd you end up in the mental hospital? So I, I don't really remember about a day or two, but I guess when I got arrested, they took me to the county jail, and then they sent me from there to the mental hospital, the Fulton State Hospital, they call it big. And I was there for a while, and I honestly couldn't tell you right offhand how long. I want to say it was like 21 days or something. Chris's narrative contrasts sharply with the information found in court documents and news reports. According to official accounts, the crime scene was far more horrific than Chris described. The blood-smeared walls bore disturbing symbols, such as crosses drawn in blood on Tish's chest and Landon's forehead. These unsettling details weren't mentioned in Chris's retelling, but they underscore the brutal nature of the events that night. When authorities arrived the morning after, it wasn't Chris who called them, it was Tish's father, Eric Yarbrough. Eric had entered the home to find a gruesome scene. He was holding a gun, waiting for police, and told the responding officers, I've got the mother effer in here, referring to Chris, who was inside the house. The officer who attended the scene said he could make out the word Lucifer and Michael written in blood on a bedroom wall. He asked Chris while they were sitting in a patrol car if he had shot his wife. He replied, bullets wouldn't work, so I used a knife. Chris also said that his wife had been gone for four or five hours and that he had used a knife to cut himself. Chris told him his wife was Lucifer, he was Michael the Archangel and Landon Piercy the Antichrist. The cop also said Chris wanted to take credit for killing his wife and son, but instead he told the cop they had been killed by the blood of Christ through Michael. The difference between Chris's confused recollection and the stark gruesome reality of the crime scene leaves us with many unanswered questions. How much did Chris actually understand about the horror he had caused and what truly drove him to commit these acts? So what's it back looking back now years knowing that, I mean, you literally did this drug and then killed your family. That's a big headline. For the first couple of years that I was, well, I was locked up. So I had a forensic psychologist or psychiatrist come and see me and do some tests with me and stuff. And he diagnosed me with what's called drug induced psychosis, which goes beyond the drug, goes beyond the high of the drug. It basically is what is basically is essentially like brain damage from a drug causing a long lasting psychotic episode. Yeah, so, but it's also not admissible in court, right? It's admissible for drug induced psychosis but it's hard to prove drug-induced psychosis. And the problem becomes that 
the prosecutor will pretty much always try to say, oh, this just happened because someone was high, even though well, there's a difference between sure. being high. And the- Did you plead guilty or not guilty? I pled guilty. Um, but the, the crazy thing is when I was in county jail, they and this is documented in my paperwork and everything, literally over-medicated me into almost a vegetative state and pretty much talked my family into convincing me to plead guilty, telling me that there was nothing else I could do. Did you, When you pled guilty, did you know your sentence or they handed that down at court from the judge? I knew. But it took me about two years or maybe three years to start to come back to normal after that. And then while I was in camp, the amount of medication they put me on, it just made me pretty much a vegetable. Most of the nine months I was in county is a complete blur. I can honestly only remember probably a week or a month's worth of the seven months that I spent full. What did what they sentence you to? They sentenced me to life without parole. Do you think you deserve that? It's a two-sided question in a way. Because on the side, just for the shame that I feel and for the remorse I feel and the loss I feel for my wife and my son, that part of me feels like there's not a sentence bad enough that they could have given me. But then on the legal side, just on the what constitutes first-degree murder side, then I definitely know this wasn't a first-degree murder. It was a horrible crime. In contrast to Chris's recounting, the prosecution painted a more chilling picture during the trial, drawing on both forensic evidence and witness statements. One key piece of evidence used against him was the argument he and Tish had the day before the murders, an argument over credit card spending. This was presented as a possible catalyst for the violence that erupted the following day, suggesting a buildup of tension in the household. Ultimately, Chris accepted a plea deal avoiding a potential death penalty in exchange for pleading guilty to two counts of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life without parole. Despite his claims of a drug-induced psychotic state, the court focused on the brutality of the crime. Tish was shot in the forehead, and their infant son, Landon, was beaten to death. These grim details, alongside Chris's admitted drug use leading up to the murders, left little room for doubt in the eyes of the prosecution. During the sentencing, Chris made a tearful apology, expressing remorse for what he had done. Yet, for the family of Tish and Landon, it wasn't enough. In a packed courtroom, Tish's relatives spoke of the profound loss and heartbreak, with some expressing their wish for the death penalty, a sentence they felt was more fitting for such a horrific crime. After the break, we get Chris's perspective on his time in prison. So you went to prison pretty young. How does that feel knowing you're going to basically grow old and an old man in there and then pass away? For the first several years, it was, it was just a downward spiral. I actually tried to kill myself in 2012. How would you try to do that? I cut my wrist. And I, I cut it. I did it bad, too. It was, it was terrible. Did you have somebody in the cell with you? Yeah. it was. I did it almost... It was like middle of the night, early in the morning, mm-hmm. and he had to get up and go to bed at 4 o'clock in the morning. And had he not gotten up to go to bed, I probably would have died. He pretty much saved my life. So. Do you think he'll end up trying again? No, definitely not. Okay. No, I'm in a completely different place. Now. It took a long time, and, and there was a lot, of, a lot of self-hatred, a lot of years of just yeah. kind of looking for a way to die, but... I'm in a completely different place now. I ended up in 2017 becoming a Christian. And in 2020, I started, I became a part of the HLGU Freedom on the Inside Bachelor's Degree in Biblical Studies program. Chris's time in prison has been filled with a constant battle against the crushing weight of guilt and regret. In the years following the murders, Chris admits that he struggled deeply with thoughts of suicide feeling overwhelmed by the horror of what he had done. His search for solace eventually led him to religion, a discovery that he says gave him the strength to continue living, even in the face of life without parole. While Chris may have found a way to cope with the reality of his actions, the tragedy remains undeniable, 
A young mother and her infant son lost their lives in a brutal act of violence that still echoes through the lives of their families. As I reflect on this devastating case, I can't help but wonder what led to such a catastrophic outcome. Was it the instability and trauma of Chris's upbringing, his descent into drug use, or was it something deeper, something that even Chris himself might not fully understand? One question still lingers in my mind, Chris's relationship with his biological father. He mentioned only briefly that he reconnected with his father after years of separation, but we haven't delved into what that reunion meant to him. Did his father's absence play a role in shaping who Chris became, or was it simply a missing piece in a much larger puzzle? Before we end this story, I want to ask Chris about his father. And in doing so, I discover something unexpected. Something that would change the way Chris experiences prison forever. Why would you not have a relationship with your father, but you do now? Did you, do you think your mother kept you from him or your dad just took off and didn't care? I'm not 100% sure. I don't think my mom really wanted me to have too much of a relationship with him, but I also don't think that she necessarily tried to stop it, but she wasn't super encouraging of it, if that makes sense. And then with him, I think that it was after so many years of not being in my life, it was almost like, oh, what do I say if I just pop up now? Now that y'all are talking, do y'all discuss things about why he didn't wasn't around? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, I actually made the decision before we got in touch with each other that, that I had really let go of some of the animosity I had as a kid. And I just told myself that when and if I ever got a hold of him, um, I would be content to just get to know him. And so that's what we did when we first started talking. Did he reach out to you or did you reach out to him? I reached out to him. Um, How did you find him? It was actually through, I met a woman about, well, about three years ago, mm -hmm. and she actually helped me find her, and uh, she's been a, a major blessing in my life. So. Do you have a girlfriend on the outside? Yeah, I actually, we actually would be married when she came to visit last March. She lives in Sweden, but when she came to visit Sweden, last March. Sweden, the country? Yeah, in Sweden, the country. Wow. But, uh, yeah, she's, we've been together about three years now. Did she use like some kind of a website to look for inmates and found you or what? It's funny. She actually contacted someone I know and told him I'm, I'm not looking for a relationship. I basically just want to talk to somebody and ask some questions about American prison, stuff like that. And he was looking for a relationship. So he told me, <laughs> he said, Hey, I know you're not looking for a relationship. Would you be interested in talking to this girl from Sweden? Another inmate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And my family comes from Sweden. My uh, grandma was first generation Swedish, so I thought that would be a cool thing to talk to her. Sure. It's funny we just we hit it off, and several months later we talked. We were just friends for quite a while. But, yeah. yeah. What would cause you to say I don't want a girlfriend? Every guy wants, especially when you're in there, you're lonely. You probably want that affection. I've spent a lot of years. Which is the feeling of, I, I'm not trying to sound like I'm on a pity party or anything, but just that feeling of not deserving to be happy. Yeah. And, uh, and it, it really took meeting her uh, and, and our friendship for me to ever reach a point where I was okay with being happy. And, and not to get too personal with her, but just to allow us, me and the listeners, to, to paint a picture. What type of girl is this? Does she have a professional job? Does she? What does she do? Yes, she actually, when I met her, she was a ICU nurse. And uh, she is uh, a, a, a great woman. She's just got a great heart. She's compassionate. Loving and understanding. Yeah, as you can imagine. She really is. She became my best friend before she became anything else. We both kind of laugh and joke now about the fact that we were pretty much in love with each other for several months before <laughs> we were ever willing to talk about it. And she's actually flown all the way from Sweden to, to set up a visit with you? Yeah, she came and visited, not this previous March, so not last month, but the March before. And we're hoping to, to see each other again here before too long. That would have been horrible if she flew all the way over here and you guys got locked down or something for a week. 
Cause that's, yeah, oh, believe me, that's something that we talked a lot. We had to get stripped out and everything to come into the visiting room. The inmates, obviously, not the visitors. So, and so I had to get dressed again. I come through this little door, and as soon as I cracked it open, she was the very first thing that I saw. And I got so nervous and, and was just, I, I, could, I was smiling so much. My face was bright red. My cheeks were hurt. I, I walked up and just said hi. And she got up and gave me a hug and a kiss. And it was just, it just immediately turned into just one of the best moments of my life. Wow. Yeah, it was great. This woman that's an ICU nurse and obviously a, probably a, a really good human being, she's hugging up guy that killed two people and one of them is a child and it's yours how did she get around that did she forgive you or what we talked about it and again like with my dad she understood i think getting to know me and getting to understand who i was and then hearing what actually happened she realized that no matter how gruesome all of this may seem in the news or online and everything like that that the truth is that it was an accident and and again i always say this because I never want anyone to think that I'm trying to deny any kind of responsibility. I get that this accident was my fault, but there was no intention, there was no desire for any of this to happen. Yeah. So this was... Nice. Man, I appreciate you opening up to me. I know that's difficult. That's just crazy about that particular drug because I have heard that story and it's just right there over the counter and you can just take it and it's, it does that kind of crap. But it sucks that it happened, man. The bad thing is you can't undo it, but I hope you do your time okay, and I appreciate you opening up. I appreciate you listening to me and giving me a platform to, I guess, tell the tell the actual story of what happened. Yep, no problem, man. Take it easy, okay? All right, you too. All right, see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. On the next episode of Voices of a Killer. I was molested when I was seven. My dad used to get drunk and beat me uh, with anything he'd get his hands on. Dog chains, sand blades, stealing sand blades. My brother-in-law came to me and said that he knew where there was $20,000 at. All we had to do was break into the house and get it. I actually found out where they lived, and I shopped their house up. Did y'all start really ransacking the house? Yeah. There was something in her hands, and I didn't know if it was a knife, a gun, or what. And so you, I threw her to the ground and tried to take off. Okay. And when I did, my brother-in-law ran back up the hallway and started stomping her on the, in the head. Why do you think he did that? I have no clue. I hope and pray one day that my kids will ever reach out to me. I want to thank Chris for sharing his story with us today. His ability to be open and honest is what makes this podcast so special. That's a wrap on this episode of Voices of a Killer. A big shout out to Sonic Futures who handled the production, audio editing, music licensing, and promotion of this podcast. If you want to hear more episodes like this one, make sure to visit our website at voicesofakiller.com. There you can find previous episodes, transcripts, and additional information about the podcast. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Your feedback helps us improve and reach new listeners. Thank you for your support, and we can't wait to share more stories with you in the future. Thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Toby, and we'll see you next time on Voices of a Killer.